Good morning, everyone, and thank you all so much for being here, and thanks to Global Minnesota for hosting this extraordinary conference. And, you know, I look at the full seats out there and the international journalists who are out here, and only in Minnesota on a snowy Friday morning could you pull the, this number of people here together. And so I'm grateful for this opportunity to moderate the panel and to speak with five of these extraordinary journalists who have, have come through the Twin Cities here. And so there are so many dynamics to talk about, of course, not just in terms of the nations that these journalists represent and report about and for, um, but their reflection perhaps on how they perceive the United States and how developments that we saw in the previous excellent lecture are impacting their countries and their work as well. But I thought that we'd all just take a couple of minutes and, and get to know these journalists here. Um, and, and get a sense of you know, what they do, what their news organization is like, and at least just from a beginning perspective, just get a sense of some of the unique challenges that they might find in their work and, and perhaps some common themes will emerge you know, that all journalists are, are looking at now and, and, and that news consumers should be aware of. But we'll start right here you know, with you, Elmi, in, in terms of you know, the work that you do with Television Broadcast Limited in Hong Kong. So please. Thank you very much. Um, nice to meet all of you. My name is Elmi. Can you hear me properly? Okay, thank you. My name is Elmi Lung. I'm from Hong Kong, and I've been working as a reporter um, on and off, but since 2008. So I've had a couple years where I left the industry and worked in you know, public relations, but I'm back as a TV news reporter and I also anchor the main news. Now, in Hong Kong, some of you might be familiar, we have two official languages. One is English, and the other, obviously, now being part of China, would be Chinese. So I'm primarily with the English channel, which also presents other difficulties when it comes to reporting, um, namely because government officials are now very accustomed to presenting and speaking to the press and the public in Chinese, so if we were to wait for an official line to take from the government, it would come out a lot later than the Chinese version. So that's just one of the challenges that I face in my daily work. Thank you very much. And before we turn to your fellow panelists in a, in a moment, I just wanted to mention that everyone in their packet today um, got a question card. So I certainly want to leave some time to get your perception of these issues, know what you would like to ask these journalists, and if these five up here are anything or any bit like me, you'll get some of these questions, and I'll wonder, why didn't I ask that? Or, you know, why aren't you up here asking, asking these questions? So we look forward to your participation in the discussion, and, and you know, certainly um, Tim and, and others will be collecting these, and, and we'll be going through these here. But I, I thought that I would turn to Anderson and, and get a sense of, um, you know, what, what you do um, for your news organization. And, and as you begin to discuss this, Anderson, I, I know, you know your news organization is, is based in Ecuador, but if I'm not mistaken, you do some reporting out of Venezuela as well. Nice to meet you. I am Anderson. Uh, sorry for my pronunciation. I'm really nervous. This is the first time speaking English from on stage. Uh, I'll try to do my best. I, I found a, a social media news outlet like a year and a half ago with a partner in Ecuador, we are trying to engage millennials to a political conversation. We are a really young media outlet in Ecuador, just competing with uh, traditional media who have been there uh, for more than a century and trying to be trustful and, and to have a different way of c communicate the news. Uh, we try to to inform the people uh, using memes, uh, using WhatsApp, using uh, the 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 language we use when when we we speak with real persons, not as a journalist. I, we don't use ties uh, when we make our shows. Uh, I am personally an investigative reporter. I've been covering government corruption and organized crime and drug trafficking in my country and I I have a, a little bit of experience in in 
especially in, in political corruption, we run a lot, a lot of stories who led the vice president of the Republic, Jorge Glass, to go to jail. He's in jail now. And we're trying to, to take actions for recovering the democracy. As you may know, Ecuador is, it, it used to be until this year, one of the two non-free countries, uh, non-free press countries in South America. One is Ecuador, which, where I live, and the other one is Venezuela, where I was born. So I, I know a little bit about non-free press in my countries. Uh, that's it. We're going to turn to some of those, and in fact, you know, previously mentioned in, in the lecture was um, about the World Press Freedom Index. So we're going to talk about press freedom in each of your nations, but I thought we'd just continue da down the line here and, and get, get a quick sense um, from Tim Watkin, you know, what your role is with Radio New Zealand and, of course, a, probably a different set of challenges, but a distinctly different um, environment to, to, to operate in. Good morning, everyone. Kia ora kato um, we, yeah, very different. I think I'm probably the odd one out here and, and the media market that I work in is probably most like the United States, although there are distinct differences. Um, uh, I'm 25 years a journalist. I've worked in print, TV and radio. Um, I now work for Radio New Zealand, which is the uh, public broadcaster in New Zealand. Um, the trends that we're seeing, the kind of uh, things that are happening in the New Zealand media market, um, as I say, are probably familiar to anyone who knows the American market. We are, where our newsrooms are shrinking, uh, they are getting younger, uh, revenue is falling, especially in print, but also in television. Radio is relatively stable. Um, I didn't go into radio, I haven't switched to radio by chance. It's certainly um, where a lot of the, the stability, but also the innovation is happening. I run the podcast team at RNZ, and um, podcasts are a, an exciting new way to be able to to tell stories um, in a different medium. Um, we're seeing mergers and consoli um, consolidations. Um, some are being uh, rejected. We just had two of our, our two main print organisations uh, in New Zealand, our Commerce Commission, uh, rejected their application to, to merge um, for the sake of trying to uh, keep a plurality of voices um, going. We're seeing a huge move to online, and within online, a huge move to phones. Um, 70% of the online of our online traffic at RNZ is is, um, is now mobile. Um, Google is increasingly our homepage. Um, social media is increasingly our, our platform, um, and our quest for younger audiences is um, ongoing. Well, thank you very much. And I thought we'd just turn to your colleague on, on your left, um, Bunmi Yukini, in terms of um, your role with Radio Nigeria and. Um, when we get into the part of the conversation about some of the challenges, I, I you know, would note that uh, you know, certainly there are, are many there. And then as we saw in the previous lecture, um, news developments in your country reflective of some of the dialogue in this country. But why don't you just briefly tell us, if you will, what, what you do in Nigeria. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm a maternal and child health advocate. I report, I produce content for Radio Nigeria, the largest radio network in Africa. Um, as you may know, Radio Nigeria is a government-owned radio station owned by the government of the day. Whoever is in power owns the radio station. So um, freedom of press is limited. You are censored. You have no right to take what does not belong to the government, even if it's coming as um, a slap to the people. But you as a journalist, you have to know how to modify it. Um, working with Radio Nigeria has been, even though it's government owned and it's, it's a bit, um, what's the word now? I don't use the wrong word. It's a bit, it's, it's enclosed, meaning that you have to follow the regulation. You can't bend rules, even though we have one of the most talented, all the most talented people working in the broadcast media today, we still have our challenges because we have to be the mouthpiece of the government, even when the government is not doing what is right. And you have no right to say no to the government because they are your, um, they are your payers, they pay your salary. Just recently before I came here, my director general gave uh, my director a query 
for allowing an audience, some audience to call into a talk show to, to castigate the government. That's how bad the situation is as far as media, um, public owned radio stations or TV stations are in Nigeria. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, we're going to get to some of those issues in just a minute. But just by finishing the introductions, Claudia Caraboli, why don't you share with us a little bit about what you do in Albania? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Claudia Caraboli. I uh, work as a news anchor. Thank you. I've been a political reporter for uh, two years, and uh, then I've been part of uh, Albanian Quality Center. is a center founded by, by U.S. Embassy in Tirana and uh, helps the new journalist who wants to investigate. I'm now an advisor there, and I've been writing a lot of uh, reportings, especially on investigate. Well, uh, media in Albania is uh, trying to survive between uh, the age of uh, analog uh, media and uh, the digital media in uh, January, uh, all the analog media will uh, turn off and we will go to digital media then. Uh, we tried it uh, two months ago, but um, we really had the problems. Uh, all the country go to a blackout, uh, televisions were, were uh, shut it off because uh, some of Albanians are still live on the other age of uh, television. But we are trying to do the best and uh, the regional media is doing the best. We have a lot of uh, broadcasting medias who cooperate with each other in region and uh, we are as a southeast uh, place in Europe, we are trying uh, to make the best for our priorities and to join the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And I'm gonna stay with you. Um, yeah. And you know, when we look at the Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index. Albania ranks 75th out of 180 countries. Yeah. Um, if you could describe to us, what's your sense in terms of the direction that press freedom is going in your country? And what are you and your fellow journalists doing to try to improve that ranking? And do you sense that the public is on your side and, and are they having playing any role in this? Well, I think uh, this rating of uh, reporters without borders is based because uh, on the things that uh, Albanians reporters or um, making news and reporting everything is affected by political issues or political interest and uh, business interest because still in Albania all the medias uh, are connected with the uh, business uh, because they need funds and that's uh, the uh, big problem there. Especially politicians, uh, they have uh, business too in Albania and uh, they can uh, go through media uh, by funding uh, different programs, different uh, shows by their monies. They are uh, a lot of televisions uh, who are known as governmental televisions. And that's why I think that uh, Reporters Without Borders rank, in, rank Albania in 70, 75th place. But we have been in uh, 85th on uh, 2006, <laughs> and I think it's a uh, good rank now. <laughs> we are moving. <laughs> so it's improved a, a little bit here. And, and yeah. Anderson, you know, unfortunately, and this is a story that everyone in this room has followed, um, Venezuela in particular has not only not improved, but has plummeted to 143rd, Ecuador itself 92nd. And, and share with us, you know, some of the challenges in both nations and you know, the degree that you and your fellow journalists um, are working collaboratively to, to try to improve this situation. Okay, I have to speak first for Ecuador, which is, which is still a country, not as Venezuela, which is a failed state. In Ecuador, uh, we have a president uh, who declared the press the enemy of the people in the state. We had a president who was uh, this, who decide to not answer the journalist questions in press conference because he don't consider the question was uh, allowed to his dignity. We had a president who passed out law to regulate the communications in the free press and we established a censorship uh, officially. So there was a man uh, appointed by, uh, by the president who can sanction the newspaper or the TV station for what you said or what you didn't because 
the law established that the the press has to cover the public interest. So if you don't publish a story, the government consider public interest, you will receive a sanction. That leads us to the close of many TV and radio stations in the struggling economy of a whole industry. A lot of journalists in Ecuador have been in jail during the last 10 years and uh, I'll like three or four of our colleagues uh, were murdered by reporting uh, stories about the government. The things are changing, the times are changing uh, be very faster uh, because the political situation changed. Uh, another uh, president is now in the, in the office since a year ago and he's trying to make the peace with the, with the press, trying to give back the the justice system and independence way to judge us and and we're trying to to restart ourselves the press in ecuador had a lot of debates during the correa's government which was the former president in the debate was should we should should be should we be in objective or subjective and we decide that we are we are not capable to be objective because we are we are not objects, we are subjectives because we are subjects. So we decide our duty is to be impartial. That means to not prefer anyone in the power or anyone to investigate or anyone to publish. And that duty uh, is what I think is going to improve the quality of journalism and free speech and freedom of the press we have in Ecuador. That duty have a red line and exception where we cannot be impartial, when we have to take an action on, on the stage, even in the political stage, we think, which is democracy, human rights, and corruption when some of these areas has been affected as democracy was in Ecuador, the press should be a defensor of democracy. The press should not allow the politicians to do what they did in Ecuador. And this is a lesson it took us 10 years to learn that the press is really important to, to the democracy itself. And it's a watchdog not only for corruption and not only for the money and the taxpayers' funds, but also for the decision the politicians made with it, make when they are in office. And that means to respect the independence of powers and, and to respect the free press too. Venezuela is t totally different. Uh, the last time I was in Venezuela I was uh, on an assignment 2016. I was deported by the intelligence police system to Ecuador uh, because they don't like journalists uh, reporting on, on the ground. You have to ask for a permission. If you don't, that's il it's considered il illegal, an illegal activity, and you can be deported to your country. That was what happened to me. In Venezuela, uh, there is no free press at all, no, no TV stations without governmental control, no newspaper can publish what they think or what they or what their facts are and of course they can be threatened directly by government officials and even murder so well thank you very much for sharing that perspective however challenging and, and stark it is and and to get a very different perspective tim you know your nation new zealand is number eight um in the world in terms of world press freedom um something clearly to indeed be very proud of in, in terms of what your nation has, has accomplished there. And, and, you know, Anderson just shared the perspective of President Maduro and, and other um, regional leaders in terms of how they view the media. New Zealand, of course, has been noted here for having a very young um, prime minister, Arden. Um, what, what's her approach to the press? How, you know, how do New Zealand media interact with, with the government and describe a little bit about what's happening to achieve that number eight status? Sure. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I am a bit of a standout here. I, I always feel slightly humbled when I come talk after someone like Anderson. I 
go to work each day completely comfortable. I'm going to go home from work each day. Um, and a number of the people here in this room don't. Um, don't have that same assumption. So um, we are very blessed where we are in New Zealand, um, but that's not without its own issues. Um, our biggest issues would be around access um, and about the impact of social media probably. Um, we still have um, problems uh, getting politicians on the record and to, to front up. I spent uh, eight years running um, the equivalent of say a Meet the Press or Face the Nation program um, in New Zealand and the ability to get politicians to come on the show each week um, and actually be confronted um, by an interviewer is getting increasingly hard. Um, the spin doctors, the advisors, the political advisors um, are very risk averse these days um, and very reluctant to put um, ministers and people in power into a situation where they actually have to be held to account. Um, example at the moment is that a, um, there is a story in New Zealand about a um, <laughs> that we've done a little bit of work on here with my um, Czech friend, um, a Czech uh, drug smuggler who was um, in prison in New Zealand and was granted um, the ability to stay in New Zealand uh, under the discretion of our immigration minister. Um, it's, it's since turned out that a number of things said were, were misunderstood or not true. Um, and the immigration minister has basically gone to ground and is refusing to do interviews. Um, now, that to me is just utterly unacceptable. Um, but we, we face that a lot and part of the impact of social media on that is that when I was running the, the TV programs I, I was, I would go to, um, to press secretaries and various ministers' office and talk about how we might approach things in a year and when they might be available for interviews. Um, and the questions have started to be, yeah, but what are your ratings? How many viewers have you got? Why would we come on if, you're not, if you've only got so many people? And um, more worryingly, why would we bother to come on and be interviewed and, and be subject to questions if you're going to give us an audience of X when I can get just about as that many by sticking my minister on Facebook um, just straight down the camera without any questions saying what we want to say. So that is the impact that I think um, you know, we're struggling with at the moment. It's much more first world problems um, than, than Anderson is facing, but it is still um, uh, getting trickier to, to hold that government to account. I should note that you say a younger Prime Minister um, who came in promising greater transparency and yet within a year has a minister refusing to give interviews. So um, they are all tempted. Seems to be a global phenomenon going on there, you know. And, yeah. and when we in Nigeria, which is ranked 119th, you shared some of the challenges that, that you face, and of course the nation you know, has an insurgency that they're dealing with, with Boko Haram, and, and you know, there are sectarian divides and, and, and many challenges, I would assume, for, for journalism. Do you sense that any of this is, is moving in the right direction or improving or getting better, or, and how are you and your fellow journalists dealing with this? Hmm. Um, it depends on which angle is facing you. That's the way you judge it. I work in a public um, organization. Um, our pay must pay our salaries, but we still have to make money. And then they still collect 25% of whatever money we make every year. So we are public, but we have to make money, which means we'll have to run commercials, get advertisement, and all of that. But fortunately for me, my salary will come. Whether I make reports, whether I make news or not, I'll get my salary. But for, yeah, but for Private media houses, especially newspaper houses, they find it difficult paying salaries because most of the media owners are businessmen who care about their businesses and not the journalists. So it's a big problem. Um, barely five of the newspaper houses can pay salary quite well. Some of them are owing about two years salary, but the reporters will still be going to work because that is a platform for them. It's a platform where, when they go out on an assignment that they are assigned to themselves, they'll go and present that platform wherever assignment they are going to. And then, of course, um, the brown, they call it brown envelope in Nigeria. You get tips for covering such an assignment. And then that becomes their bread and butter for the day. And then they take their story 
to the newspaper house and get published, of course, by settling the editor on duty from the tip they get from the assignment they went to cover. So it's, it keeps going on and on year in, year out. There's not, even though we have um, associations, we have Niger Nigerian Union of Journalists, we have um, Nigeria Guild of Editors, we have Broadcasters Association of Nigeria, but none of them it seems to be getting it right in that regard. And then we have, um, as I said, media owners are politicians or they are friends to politicians. So it, d it determines what comes out in the news. So most politicians will come and hand them hand handouts, then their stories will make cover page. Or their stories will take most of the pages in the newspaper, and that becomes their bread and butter. But the reporters are not being considered in all of this. We keep fighting. We talk about this every meeting day in Congresses, during um, um, Congresses at the Nigeria Union of um, Journalists in Nigeria. But nothing is changing because why? We don't have strong structure. That is one of the very big problems. The structure is faulty from foundation. When you put journalists to, they are corrupt. Even managing union of journalists is a big problem, as big as the union is. So we have a lot of issues bothering, I mean, wrong with um, Nigerian journalists. But because I am from the private, I mean, public station, where I get paid, I may, I may decide to overlook those problems. But it is still our problem, you know? And most times when I go out, I do a lot of um, rural community issues, um, maternal health. We have one of the highest maternal deaths in the world. So I do a lot of those issues. But if I see that whatever story I'm bringing to the house, we disrupt the pattern of my house, of my in-house style, I am most times commissioned to do those stories for private organizations. I mean, NGOs who run uh, maternal health issues. So it's, it goes on and on and on. Well, thank you very much for sharing that perspective. And thank you all very much for the questions, which, as anticipated, are just terrific. And so we're going to turn to Elmi here, because some of the questions are very nation-specific. Some are broader, and some are about our country and how they perceive it and, and press freedom. So. Someone on the same line that we're asking here, but I'll be specific with the question. Um, and just for the record, Hong Kong is, is ranked number 70 out of 180 on the World Press Freedom Index. But the question is, Hong Kong used to be a British holding, and some still want British rule or independence. How do you handle this now that you're ruled by a totalitarian country which regulates news? Well, thank you for the question. Um, it's a difficult one. Um, I'm sure that uh, the, the one who posed this question is quite familiar with Hong Kong and how it's been 20 years since Hong Kong has been returned to China. So it was a British colony, um, 20 years of Chinese rule, and even now we're still seeing groups advocating what they call Hong Kong independence. So essentially, they want Hong Kong to break away from Chinese rule and become independent. Um, and that's been a huge problem. Uh, it's been in the news a lot because it's a huge problem for the Chinese authorities who does not want China, uh, Hong Kong to break away from China. And on an almost daily basis, you, you hear officials coming out to give the official stance that, you know, it has, anything has to abide by the Chinese constitution and this separatism just should not happen and should not be discussed. Now, in terms of reporting, we are obviously free to still report on both sides of the argument. Um, there's no censorship on that level. But what we are seeing is um, a lot of difficulties in, um, in our daily reports in terms of access and also rules that seem to be changing. And what I mean by that is that Hong Kong does not have a, a national security bill like the one in China, which if passed, there will be certain penalties. Um, and lately, the government, back in April, I think, they banned one of these uh, Hong Kong independence groups. And it was not 
citing a national security bill. It was citing a local um, um, a local rule that regulates groups. So then, why wasn't this incited um, a lot sooner? Why was it now? And then why? So, so a lot of uncertainties there, and why government officials so keen on talking about that when they were asked about other social issues? So it's frustrating on our level, but also um, I would say that because of the press freedoms that we still enjoy in Hong Kong, um, we are also getting a lot of requests or um, people from mainland China reaching out to Hong Kong reporters asking us to help tell the stories that they might not otherwise be able to tell on the mainland. So one example I can give you is that um, for our station, we're based in Hong Kong. Um, we're the largest uh, private TV stations in Hong Kong with a very steady viewership numbers. Um, given our close proximity to China, to the Chinese mainland, we have bureaus in Guangzhou and another one in Beijing, which is the capital. Um, Basically, the uh, Beijing reporter's mobile number is like an open secret. When I was stationed in Beijing for maybe two months of a year, you would get phone numbers from random people from different Chinese provinces asking you to tell their stories. Sometimes it might be a dispute between farmers, it might be a commercial dispute, sometimes it's just like, uh, <coughs> can you help us? We've got this story and it would be great if you can come down. But China is a big country and do you always First of all, can you verify that what they're telling is true? And do you have the time and money to cover that story? So it's, it's definitely a challenge um, that we face in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, I personally feel that there are more barriers set uh, for reporters to tell their stories than in the past in terms of press arrangements, in terms of um, the deadlines that we have to meet which means that we might not be able to spend that much time on a story and go in depth. So that's a problem that I, I feel it's uh, really making an impact on the news industry. Thank you. Some of these questions are just terrific and could be answered by all of you. We may not turn to everyone for each question so we can get to as many as, as possible. Claudia, we'll bring you back into the conversation. Um, there are several questions somewhat framed by this one. Have you seen cases or disinformation groups as we saw in the previous lecture? try to pose as your news outlets online, um, and in general, to what degree are you and your colleagues running into the issue of fake news and fake news being a real thing, you know, in, in terms of, of disinformation that outside groups or groups within your country are trying to push forward? Mm. Um, let me start. Um, in Nigeria, it would be difficult to curb fake news. Fake news is a global thing. Why is it so? Because, um, as I said earlier, a lot of media houses don't pay their um, worker salary. So it is who pays the piper, they take the tunes. And most of these um, reporters, when they go out or they get called by people who want to spread the fake news, people deliberately spread fake news. It's intentional. It's not, it's not a robotic um, formulation. They spread it, they use it so that they can get, it's either get um, attraction, I mean fame, either be, become famous positively or negatively. So most reporters, when they get those news like that, they, it comes with handouts, of course. When my newspaper is not paying me salary and I get this person giving me this money to cover this, I mean to report this news, even if it is fake, I'll do it. But again, um, the social media is a playground for a lot of um, citizen journalists in Nigeria and even reporters who don't have a steady job. So it is one of the best ways of spreading fake news. So they go there. They know a lot of people will view it, they will read it, they will talk about it. So it, it starts spreading. A lot of these people doing that don't have good job. They don't have where they will see um, salary. So that is what they depend on, because somebody is definitely paying for those news to, to be published. It didn't just come there. So that's the situation in Nigeria. It will continue, except if the government of the day take a, a, a bold step by giving them, um, Nigeria again is a, is a country that breaks law. We are lawless. 
So even when the Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation, the one that regulates everything that comes out in the media, tells them, you don't have to say this thing. If you say it, you're paying a penalty of a sum of uh, maybe three, um, $60 million, some media houses will pay that fine and then break the law because they know they will make a lot of money after that. That's how it works in Nigeria. Thank you. And, and Claudia, of course, Europe has, has struggled with this challenge, particularly uh, uh, Southeast Europe. So, In fact, uh, we have a lot of problems with fake news. Uh, we are in Albania. We have uh, 3 million citizens. And we have uh, 900 portals or online media. So everyone from the students can find a, work to pl to a place to work there. But uh, on the statistics, just uh, 100 of these portals are owned by uh, journalists or other uh, media workers who know how to uh, fact check uh, the information and uh, all the other stuff to work and to report there as a journalist. So you can imagine what happens with 800 portals and what can do people uh, who can uh, especially can uh, write or use them to uh, write uh, different stories or to shake fake news that can affect uh, people's life a lot. That's the situation there with fake news. Thank you very much. And, and a few specific questions addressed to specific panelists. Anderson, question comes to you um, on an issue that so many Americans saw in the, up in, leading up into the midterm elections, but how would you describe the realities in South and Central America that lead to caravans of people migrating northward? I think I, I will I will speak about Venezuela, uh, which is we are living the same in the south of the continent. We have a caravan of Venezuelans trying to spread out to all the countries in South America. Why? Uh, because uh, Venezuela is not a country anymore. I mean, I I've been there in 2016, the first night I spent on my city, Caracas, the capital city. I went to a hospital, it was a kid's hospital. And I found a mother just with his baby in a, how do you call this? Feeding? Yes, just feeding the, feeding the baby. And I asked her, uh, where, where did you get the milk? Because I know that there was no milk in Venezuela. And she told me, no, this no, no, this is not milk. This is flour and and water. So when you get to that point, uh, when you cannot feed your babies, uh, not because it's a poor country, uh, because it was not, uh, but because we have a corrupt government, a corrupt government, economic economical crisis, no rights, no human rights, no security. I spent a month in Venezuela and I have to stay in the hotel since five o'clock of the noon because it was too dangerous to go for a cigarette outside. So the the owner of the hotel led me to smoke in the room, which was great. But I, I feel like in jail there. And I spent 30 days just looking, looking the window in my hotel because I cannot go outside when when some puts puts out and it's really difficult to understand this from outside uh, I, in ecuador we had a very similar situation 20 years ago when the economy just broke down three millions of ecuadorians just run away i think like 100,000 of those are here in minneapolis and and even ecuador who knows really well why somebody will let uh, will run away of his own country are now feeling fear of these venezuelans trying to get uh, trying to start again in another land and you you nobody goes out of his country because they want to they are not immigrants the immigrants are those who say, okay, I'm going to another country because I want to live there. They are desplazados, is the, the Spanish word, which means you cannot stay there, so you have to move. 
you don't want to have. I think the same is happening in Central America now. They don't want to go out. They just need to do it. Thank you very much. We have many internationally interested young people here, and there are several questions uh, about uh, um, young people and their role in this. One specifically um, addressed to you, Tim, so I'll, I'll ask you, but somewhat representative of a lot of these great questions. What are youth's role in media, sustainability, and making choices? In, and I think specifically from a media perspective, what role do you think that, that youth are playing and should be playing? Um, they need to teach us how <laughs> to talk in their language um, so that we can actually keep communicating. Uh, there's a lot of us who, uh, the, the generation gap um, is, and the technology gap go hand in hand. Um, and so in the mainstream media, we are desperately trying to find where the audiences are moving to, um, how they are consuming news. Um, and I guess uh, younger people are making those moves faster. Um, than most of the media are, and so we have to keep up with them. Um, so partly your, uh, your role is to maybe slow down and let's catch up. Um, but um, look, it's, it's also, uh, at, a, at a young age, um, it's media literacy. It's actually um, taking the time to learn how the media works um, and understand what we're trying to do. Um, I think there are, there are rules that we operate um, under which we're probably more assumed to be known a couple of generations ago. Um, some of the basic rules of, of news reporting and, and how the media works, I mean, for example, the, the gap between opinion and news. Um, we've created such a blurred world now for that that I think a lot of people growing up today uh, don't understand the lines there and the importance of those lines. Um, and so part of the media literacy is to actually <sighs> to figure out why we do what we do it's not usually um, because we're nefarious or we're trying to get one over on you. It might be um, out of desperation. It might be out of revenue, revenue gathering. It might be out of trying to just try something new. Um, but we are usually trying to, to serve our audience as best we can. Um, but we need to, um, we, I think we need to be clearer on our end in the way we do things and why we do things. But you need to meet us halfway with that. Um, and of course, you need to actually um, uh, support. <laughs> Support the media. It sounds like I'm looking for a charity now, and this is where the media has got to, right? You actually have to, you know, consume us and consume the good stuff. You actually have to use your judgment. Ignore the shit and, and find the good stuff. It's really important um, because there is really good reporting. Um, Tom, I think, in his, in his comments, talked about in the 90s how um, the amount of foreign coverage went from 4,000 to 1,000. Um, today's problem is not the lack of of content. There is, there is phenomenal amounts of good quality journalism, foreign coverage. Um, I mean, you now in Minneapolis can read any major newspaper on the globe. You couldn't do that in 1990. You have phenomenal opportunities and privileges in that. But you have to choose the good stuff. You have to support the good stuff. Um, you have to learn what the difference is. Thank you for that response, and again, thank you for all the questions. And among the questions, I got a note that we can go to about 11:40, which gives us 10, 11 minutes or so. And so there are, we've talked a lot about your nations and some of the, you know, dynamics affecting your work and your fellow um, citizens in in your countries. But I thought that we would end to have all of you comment on some of the great questions we got about our country and what you perceive from the nations you report from, and then of course on this wonderful opportunity of, of this trip here to the United States. Um, it's summed up well in, in this question. We'll start with you, Elmi, in, in just a moment. Um, what is your opinion of U.S. democracy, press freedom, and human rights? <laughs> you may want to take you, the full 11 sure minutes on your own, but, uh, <laughs> but what's your, you know, it, particularly in terms of, you know, the, the United States has long tried to be a beacon of free press, you know, for the rest of the world. How are we upholding that, that role that we've traditionally had? Not good. 
Or aren't, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually glad for a second that I'm not like live on air when the anchor <laughs> throws me that question. Um, it's been a real eye-opener um, on this trip so far. So I have been to the U.S. before, and that was way back. It was um, I went to New York in 2002, so that was a year after 9-11. Uh, when I was still a student. Um, but this trip, it was more focused on uh, the media industry. And I feel like whether you like the press or not, whether you like the, uh, the network that, you know, uh, um, that might have a certain bias, um, there's still a lot of respect for the reporters and the networks because you have a choice between all these different uh, stations and you can choose which ones you want to pick or you want to go through all of them and be informed before making your own decision and your opinions. Um, and that's something that I think in Hong Kong we still lack. It's that um, appreciation for what journalists do. Um, if you allow me to just share a bit more information about Hong Kong. Uh, while we are a rather small city, even though densely populated with over 7 million people, uh, we have a lot of print and news media outlets. But like Tim said, you know, like in New Zealand, we have also had, um, we've also have been shrinking the industry as a whole. And as a fact, um, as a result, we have seen a lot of middle management people with experience. They leave because the pay is not very good. they working hours or way too long. Um, I think it was someone who said they, they go to work. F was it you again, Tim? Um, so knowing I'll go home. Uh, yeah, what time do you go home? Like, you finish, <laughs> you finish yeah, good eight? point. Eight? Um, no, I'm seven. I'm you seven. Ten hour day is pretty standard. 10 hours standard. We work maybe 12, 14 hours sometimes, and um, it's driving people away from the industry. Yep. The Same. pay is low, you're not respected, Our officials don't really care, they don't, they don't really need you anymore because they've got social media as well. They might come to you when they've got um, uh, a government campaign that they want to launch and they want to take advantage of your station and your viewership, um, but on the whole, you have a lot of internal challenges and you have young people, enthusiastic people, fresh graduates who join, but unfortunately still inexperienced and news quality does suffer as a result. And so it's a, it's a cycle. You know, people, you don't respect the media. Re media, you're not helping yourselves by generating a lot of content, but perhaps of low quality and you are sacrificing um, quality because you want to beat the others in rolling out your news first. So it's a poor cycle that we're facing. And I think here in the US, at least there's some sort of understanding of how the media works um, and how social media also plays a role, which um, which to me, I think, you know, that, that was really beneficial. Claudia, we'll turn to you here. How is the US doing in its role of upholding a free press for the rest of the world? I will give an uh, example in Albania. I think um, I've been, I am part of Albanian Quality Journalism Center. It's founded by U.S. Embassy. We started as a small group by 10 people. Um, we were ju just young uh, students of journalism, and uh, we have been trained by American professors that uh, U.S. Embassy uh, take to Albania to give us uh, lessons about journalism, democracy, democracy in America. And uh, we uh, took their examples uh, to do something or to change things in Albania by uh, reporting on uh, corruption of uh, different institutions, especially for politicians, for uh, municipality or um, other corruption of uh, economy. So I think that the US Embassy or in our country, or um, America <laughs> in uh, general terms, has helped a lot uh, for the freedom of press, but it has uh, their problems too. <laughs> and they are um, shown and in other countries, I think. But everything, uh, the problem is, in my opinion, that um, it's changing the, not the news or Fake news have been always there, but it's the age of uh, social media, changing platforms, and that's uh, they are these effects <laughs> going on. Thank I'd you very much. Can I just, Please, very, Tim, just, just very briefly say, um, I pick up on the earlier speaker, um, we can't talk about media as a whole. Um, it is a plural. Um, there is some outstanding journalism being done in America, 
um, but there are also some big struggles and some and a lot of that comes down to um, the fact that in the past generation really um, a number of media have moved away from impartiality and so the partisan channels TV mostly um, and the social that spins from that is probably um, I think it's fair to say damaging your reputation around the world yeah. uh, okay. please Anderson I, I would like to share something with you uh, when when Mr. Correa took the power, the press feel that it was his duty to investigate the power in, in the most, the best quality investigative journalism in Ecuador. I think it was produced in the very early years of Mr. Correa's government. It made no difference. People doesn't care. People didn't care about it. And the credibility of the press just fall down until the end of the list. It was the least credible institution in our country. We were very worried because of that and we had a lot of debates and conversations just as you are, you are, you are having now. And we found that we need to, to show people that the press was, or, the, or the media was not only there to confront the power and try to get them accountability but we need to recover the image of the voice of the voiceless. We need to to show the people we take care of them. We are trying. So we had a real dramatic situation in 2016. It was a earthquake. A lot of people died. A lot of journalists went to the ground zero and report like 15 days in a row without stopping and since that day you can see in the in the polls the credibility of the press became to to increment now we are the second most credible institution again okay. it is not because we confront the power but because we take care again of people and that's our first duty as a journalist to take care of our society and I'm really glad to see because where you see a United States polarized I see a society debating and and that's not bad for any democracy I'm really glad you can fix your troubles your political issues just debating just talking and expressing ideas in on in other ways as we have done before so I think when the media gets to reality and, and say, okay, it's important to get politicians to accountability, but also it's important to show why the media is important to your life, that will be a change. And you don't have to care too much about fake news, basically because they are not news. That's why in Spanish we don't call it noticias falsas, because a new have to be a fact and a fact is a true so this debate uh, will be will be passed and I believe the people is smarter enough smarter than journalists I think we are in the we are debating in the wrong way we think the journalists have to educate people in order to they can difference the fake news from the news and I think the people is smarter than the media and the journalists and they can figure out. That's why when you see a fake news, you will wait until you see, until see it in, a, in your preference uh, media outlet. And it's okay for me, but I, I don't agree really with Tim in this. I, I think it's great for a democracy to have partitions, media outlets. I mean, if you want to if you watch MSNBC and, and Fox and, and you see two different countries there, you have the opportunity to choose where country you want to live. <laughs> it's your problem. <laughs> so. I think the entire nation just went through that during our midterm election this week. And when we were going to end with you, how is the U.S. doing in its role as a leader of the free press? Okay. Um. There is a saying in Nigeria that says, if you haven't been to um, another man's farmland, you will think your father's farmland is the biggest. <laughs> yes, um, 
last week we were in Alabama and we're part of the election coverage. When they told me I was going to be shadowing with one of the reporters with um, WAFF 48 News, I was very excited and interested. So when we got there, I asked Chris, is his name? I asked him, where is the, what is happening? I said, this is where we are covering. This is where, I said, really? Here, in this hall that tables are set, drinks are being prepared, and all that. This is a tea party. <laughs> uh, is this election coverage? I was amazed. That is no election coverage in Nigeria. <laughs> For real. Election coverage, you can't be in a room like this and be preparing one table, table for people to sit and enjoy themselves. When we are supposed to be outside, it's on the field. You know, you have people, journalists running, elder scatter, trying to capture people who are snatching ballot boxes, trying to see who is making um, election um, bribe and all of that. And you come and sit in one fine all Jackson Center, and you say you're covering election. That is new for me. <laughs> and in Nigeria, election is just one day, and you have to have a public holiday. <laughs> but here, you have a whole week. You do. Election in Nigeria, two weeks, right? <laughs> that is new to me, and I'm so impressed. I just wish Nigeria would be able to copy this, but I doubt it. Yes, because we are difficult people, I must say. <laughs> because we have a lot of stubborn people who would rather go against the law than follow the law. For real. And it was an high opener. Even though I know USA has its own problem, but I think it's still a learning ground. I know we have a lot of pros and anti-Trump. He has his issues, and people have their issues. But I think, and of course, they are gold standard. People look up to them as the number one when it comes to politics, economy, social, and all of that. They have their issues too. But I think compared to Nigeria, they are still, they, they should be followed. Yes, because I've never seen an election such as, wow, you come to a gathering and you sit down, you cross your legs, and you're drinking and you're waiting for the election results to be announced. That is new. <laughs> Huh. So can I just add one please. thing to yeah, that? I mean, please. Um, Bumi, what, what you yeah. said about covering the elections, um, um, I just want to share that in Hong Kong while we, we say we have a free press. Um, the government restrictions in covering any sort of um, official uh, press conferences, they've been getting stricter and stricter in the sense that when, we first start, when I first started, um, you were able to get really close to the officials. Um, you were not like for example in this um, hall you're not barred from going up to them they didn't put like a, a banner like you know one of those uh, crime scene stickers just to divide <laughs> the press mm -hmm. area and the official like speakers area um, so actually when government officials say they will take questions here's when you need to think whether we have that freedom in asking freely, in getting access, or whether it's just having an event where they come and speak to you and not take any questions at all. Like, how, how do you judge press freedom? So that's something that, you know, I, I feel very strongly about, that, that access to getting information and how that's slowly but steadily shrinking. Well, we have a presidential election here in very quick time here. We'd love to have all of you back to observe, to comment, and to be that dog reporter. You probably will be here. Exactly. <laughs> Elmi Anderson. Thank you all to our panelists. And thank you all for the terrific questions tonight. Thank you.